my good friend Wanda White. I mean, when I first met her, type two diabetic. Um, over the years that we worked together, uh, she started losing weight. She started adapting a plant-based diet. Um, now I just saw her the other day. Um, she's lost another 20 pounds. Um, her doctor's considering taking her off the metformin that she's on for her for her diabetes. Um, she's almost completely reversed type two diabetes. You are listening to Plant Strength Radio. Each week, remarkable stories of plant-based healing, mindfulness, fitness, nutrition, and activism, as told by those with the expressed desire to affect lasting change in our world. Real people, real experiences. Your host, Bobby Lynch. What's up, guys, and welcome to Plant Strength Radio. I'm your host, Bobby Lynch, and on today's show, we have Ken Box. Among many things, during his extensive career in the food service industry, Ken opened the famous 90s West Hollywood plant-based cafe, Little Frida's, the cafe that Ellen DeGeneres went to on her first date with her wife. He started the first and still only all-vegan dining hall in the world at the University of North Texas in 2010. He helped create the Humane Society's plant-based training program, Forward Food, where he helped train over 700 institutions around the world and introduced plant-based cuisines to over 7,000 chefs during his five years with them from 2014 to 2019. And now he just recently opened the new vegan Mexican catering business in Fort Worth, Texas, New Tricks Taco Shop, soon to be a fast casual restaurant. Welcome, Ken. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. So great to be with you today. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you on. I mean, your career and background is so extensive, and I'm so happy to, to be talking with you here just to learn as an up, up and coming, you know, as a young entrepreneur myself from your experience. I'm, I'm so excited for this episode right now. No, yeah, thanks for reaching out to me. You know, the, <clears throat> at this point in my life, uh, you know, meeting people like you and being able to inspire the next generation to do the good work uh, that, that we've been doing for so many years is, is a joy and, and I'm blessed to, to, to do what I have done for so many years. I love it. I love it. You're like a father figure of the plant-based industry. This is so, oh, thank you. This is amazing. All right. So before we get into things, we're going to start the show with our icebreaker segment to warm us up. All right. You ready to go? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So if you could describe to me in three words or less how your year has been so far. Fun, fitness, family. I love it. How come? <laughs> well, uh, the fun part is I love change. And my wife and I moved from uh, California about five months ago to Fort Worth, Texas. Right. And we did that because of uh, family. Uh, my son and his wife and our four grandkiddos live uh, just about 10 miles uh, west of us. And fitness, um, as I'm sure we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit, I revived my, uh, my judo um, uh, experience and I've got myself, my son, and two of my granddaughters uh, in judo classes, which we attend three days a week. So that's uh, keeping us very focused on our, our fitness. There you go. Awesome. It sounds like you've had a, uh, had a great year so far, even given the current COVID, COVID, yeah. uh, COVID standards right now. All that change happened during COVID. I mean, we bought our house in Fort Worth virtually with a friend of ours uh, wow. who's uh, also vegan. Uh, she She's a realtor here and uh, she took us on a virtual tour and we bought the house without ever stepping foot in it. So leap of faith and uh, it's, it's been awesome. Sometimes you have to take them. That's so cool. Yeah, That's so cool. And it just kind of shows what modern technology can do with everything being online. And, and that's kind of like one of the benefits of COVID in a business sense is it kind of made businesses realize how much can be done online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, I'm super excited to get into things. So let's get started. So tell me, what made you start experimenting with plant-based living and a vegan lifestyle? When I was 18 years old, I read a book called uh, Diet for a Small Planet. Uh, very influential, changed my life. Um, that was the first book ever to introduce the term uh, uh, environmental vegetarianism 
and it just made sense to me. I mean, I was already in sports. I was already living a healthy lifestyle. Um, but I realized that my food choices uh, weren't where they needed to be. And so I, I adopted a vegetarian lifestyle back then. And the connection for me was in was the environment. How could I have the most impact with the less footprint possible? And um, that that really planted the seed for what was to come for the other you know thirty plus years that I've been on this journey. Yeah, I'm so familiar with that book, and it's funny you mentioned that book because that was actually the book that coined the whole myth around plants not being complete sources of protein. And it's funny because Frances Laporte, the author of that book, she later retracted her statement, yeah. and it's, but it's stuck. And it's something that is still taught today that plants are incomplete sources of protein, meaning they don't have all of the essential amino acids, but it's, it's completely false because they do. And you can just look it up online to see, and they all have at least some level, some more than others, but they all have every single essential amino acid. So. I, can't, I can't tell you how many conferences I've been to where dietitians have come up to me and said, well, the vegan diet's not complete and, you know, incomplete protein. And, and I make reference to that. You know, she later did retract it. And I think it was her third version of the book in the 80s. Yeah. And so many people think <clears throat> oh, you can't build muscle without meat or animal protein. <laughs> and like, that's exactly what we do here at Plant Strength Performance is defy that status quo. I mean, if you can see in the sign for everyone watching, I have it right up in the background. You don't need meat to build muscle. That's some of our activist signs up there. We kind of go around and show people that you actually can because it really just comes down to calories in, calories burned. And if you're getting enough protein in, which protein, all protein derives from plants. Yeah, I'm I'm almost 59 years old this month. Next week, I'll be 59 years old, and <clears throat> I'm in judo uh, three days a week with uh, my my grandkids and my son, and we're kicking butt on the mat. And you know, I've been vegan now for since 20, 2010, um, wow. vegetarian for most of my life, and I'm keeping up with the young bucks. So and you're you know, still here. You haven't and I'm died still of, here. You haven't died of protein <laughs> deficiency. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So. Vegan for 10 years and vegetarian for 20 plus, right? Yeah. And you're still you're still alive and well. It's crazy. It's it's almost mind blowing, mm. right? <laughs> it's 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 a, it's definitely a testament. You have to live the example, you know? And it, you know, it's not enough to just talk about our diet and you know, it's it's it really means a lot when you can show somebody by your lifestyle, um, the impact that it can have. And you know that, you know, you're an example of that as well. I love that. That's something I, I really stay very true to. Practice what you preach. You can't go around telling somebody to do something that you don't do yourself or wouldn't do yourself. So the fact that the fact that you said that, I mean, that just shows you're you're a great leader in the industry. So tell me, you worked in fast casual dining for the majority of your life, what was it, what was that catalyst that, that made you decide that working in restaurants wasn't enough and it, it led you to A, getting degrees in business, which you have, and then also B, starting your own business, New Tricks Taco Shop now? You know, with the knowledge that I had from the inspiration um, uh, from that book, uh, grow, growing up, working in the industry uh, and seeing the impact that bad food um, sadly has on people's lives. Um, I mean, you can eat junk food, fast food, whatever in moderation and still be pretty healthy. Um, but I saw people doing it, you know, repeat customers so many times and just uh, the impact that it was having on their lives. And so I realized um, back in the eighties uh, when I opened uh, little Frida's that I could, I could change the food system. You know, I was still young. I didn't know how to do it, but sometimes you just have to put it out to the universe, to God, whatever your belief is, and say, you know, just lead me. And that's what happened. Um, my, my career went uh, deep into food service, and I started being in leadership to where I could make those changes and add plant-based options to the menu, um, 
through concepts that I designed uh, for different companies that I worked with or, or even input in the companies that I was with saying, you know, hey, we have to have a healthy option on the menu. And this was back, you know, in the 80s and 90s when it was just starting up, when it wasn't cool, when vegan was the fringe and not the, the you know, the, the primary option now, like we're seeing in so many restaurants. And so, you know, m- m- it, it just continued on into my work uh, as I transitioned into college and university or what we call non-commercial space. And that um, really gave us the, the, the big break that we were looking for when we opened the vegan dining hall at UNT and, and you know, just went from there. It's amazing how <laughs> small of a world things really are because Olivia, who is featured, Olivia Dali Mink, who's featured on episode four this season, Mm -hmm. she went to UNT and she credits the dining hall that you started Mm -hmm. for her going vegan. And I think it's just so crazy because when I had previously interviewed her to be a guest on the show, I I hadn't met you yet. And then when we met back this summer, it's just how everything kind of connected. It's just, I think it's so amazing just how the universe plays out with when you put your intentions out there and the people that enter your life just at the right moments in time when you're following your passions and doing what you love. I, I think it's so amazing. Yeah, it makes me so happy to hear stories like that. I remember Olivia and, and some of the other students that uh, I've run into over the years, whether it was at, you know, um, vegan events or uh, even when I moved back here to Fort Worth, um, a student that I work with now has a, uh, a vegan marketing company, social media marketing company, uh, Courtney Garza. And um, she's also the editor for uh, Veg World Magazine. Um, wow. So you know, she, she tells me stories about, you know, how I made it possible for her to eat good at uh, university uh, when she was attending because um, we had an all vegan dining hall. And, you know, it's funny, those options, and I know we're going to talk more about it, um, expanded across the campus. And so everybody was eating plant-based and sometimes they didn't even know it because it was just about the food, you know, it was good food. It was just that good. That's all that really matters. As long as it tastes good and you can make anything nowadays vegan, any sort of dish or recipe, food, dessert that you can think of, there's a vegan alternative for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's fun. I mean, if you like to cook, getting in the kitchen and learning how to transition uh, like we did uh, when we did the forward food program with the Humane Society, learning how to take traditional dishes that are familiar favorites and convert them over to plant-based so they're better for you and they're better for the planet. Of course, like you and I care about the animals, um, then you, you, um, you can have fun. You know, it's, 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 it's a pretty cool gig. So what were some of the staple dishes at the dining hall? <laughs> You know, uh, we, my favorite was mac and cheese. Um, yes. You know, we had multiple stations in the dining hall and Chef Wanda White, who I've, who's a very good friend of mine, who uh, walked into the, the uh, project not knowing what she signed up for, um, is just one of the most uh, fantastic chefs I've ever worked with. And she, she went all in, you know, we started with uh, opening up a bunch of vegan cookbooks and created our first three week cycle menu. And we had pizza, we had panini sandwiches, we had grilled vegetables, you know, the healthy options, but really the popular stuff was the, the familiar foods. So down here in the South, um, you know, uh, just, just fried everything. <laughs> yes. Um, which you can do really, really well, as you know. Um, uh, she, I think she, she said, I think Olivia said one of her favorites was fried chicken and waffles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, that's just amazing that you guys had that in a vegan version. It was amazing. And, you know, Chef Wanda is from the South. You know, she's got this heavy Southern accent. And, and she would do um, different uh, uh, hot pies. Like every, every day there would be a different hot pie on the line. And the students would take that and, uh, over to the um, soft serve machine that we had with the, um, the soy based frozen yogurt. And they would put that on top of their hot pie. And that, that sometimes would be their lunch, not just dessert. So <laughs> it was, it was great. But I think the biggest challenge with the dining hall was what do we do with this rotisserie where, you know, they used to, you know, turn chickens on it. And so we bought these, these baskets 
and we loaded them up with vegetables and we would take um, a, a, a summer squash and, and pierce them with the, you know, with what we used to do with the, the, they used to do with the chickens and we would just roast them in the, in that rotisserie and they'd come out beautiful. The students loved it. I love that. It's just, I, that's one of the things that I love about veganism and uh, just like the diet aspect to it specifically is how creative it forces you to get to think outside of the box to think outside of the cultural norms that we're used to cooking with with meat and animal products and instead how can we innovate and make something taste just as good if not better and in a healthier way that's going to be so much healthier for you inside and out for the animals for the environment that's it's just it's just I can honestly say going vegan was one of the best decisions of my life. And I, the only regret I have is I wish I had, I, is not going vegan sooner because I, I wish I had known. I, if, if, there, if this dining hall was at my college, Union College, I think I would have gone vegan then. Yeah, well, you know, you're in New York, right? And we did a lot of uh, work out there when, when uh, af after we did the vegan dining hall, uh, Chef Wanda and I joined the Humane Society of the United States, and we, we created a, a plant-based training program called Forward Food. And um, we, we trained um, uh, hundreds of different campuses around the country. I remember we were up at NYU, and we helped, uh, helped them with a, a plant-based pop-up where they took one of their dining halls completely offline um, and and made it vegan for a week. It was it was controversial. Uh, the administration didn't necessarily want to do it, but the student push really drove the uh, desire to make them want to try it, and it was a great success. Um, so you know, if you do it right, you make the food taste good, uh, no matter where you are, whether it's in your home kitchen or you're working at an institution like a uh, university. Um, if, if you make it about the food, you can make it taste good and, and people won't even ask about it being vegan or not. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that's definitely the way to go because that's really where the pushback is when you talk about veganism. It starts with the diet. What do I even eat? Or mm -hmm. where do you even get your protein? That's the most one of the most common ones that I hear. And the goal, ultimately, I know my goal and I know your goal is the same, is to really just change the way people think about meat and animal products and to change the norm to plant-based eating. That is, that is the way of the future, is plant-based eating. It's healthier for us. It's healthier for the animals. It's healthier for the environment. It's just, it's just a win-win-win all the way around in every way that you can look at it. And, and I love that the students too were the ones pushing for that and that the administration did ultimately give them what they want because you got to give the people what they want. Yeah, well, you know, in the years that I was with the Humane Society for five years and I had a, I had a model that I would I would use to teach other advocates. Uh, I remember speaking about it at a conference I was invited to speak at in Germany uh, back in the, um, the uh, oh, right before I left the Humane Society uh, to move on to the next step. And, you know, I would tell them that, you know, in any institution, the customer, in the case of universities, the students are the, are the boss, really. It's not dining services. It's not the administration. It's the students who pay the bills, who pay tuition, who have student loans out there making money for these universities. Um, if you're a hospital, it's the patient. If you're in a business and industry office building, it's the, it's the people who are buying lunch. So that's the voice that you have to tap into if, you, if you're an advocate, if you're, if you're doing that type of work. Um, because then um, you, can, you can make it about the customer and the customer is really the boss. Um, so we, we learned that early on that we could have the biggest impact for some of those institutions that weren't quite ready um, by tapping into the student voice. That's well said. Well said. So let's let's talk about your career and we'll start right kind of back at the beginning when you were like 18, 19 years old, what you were doing. Because I, I, I know you also said you were doing some jujitsu mm -hmm. and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll kind of transition into your career into the industry and we'll kind of take a, a step by step timeline approach and we'll we'll go down and, and just kind of see where you went from opening Little Frida's to working with, uh, to going to UNT, to working with Humane Society. Before getting into that though, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this message from our sponsors. Support for this episode comes from Chicken Bites. 
Hey, did you know that every serving of chicken bites has 17 grams of protein? And did you know that they're made entirely from simple ingredients? Visit www.plantstrengthfoods.com to find out where you can get your pack of chicken bites and use offer code PSR at checkout to save on shipping. Chicken bites, always made from ingredients you can pronounce. Support for this episode comes from Trupo Treats. Brian and Charlie Trupo were on a mission to find the most delectable treat of them all, chocolate. Unfortunately for them, there were very few vegan chocolates on the market. So together, the twin brothers had an epiphany. Why not make our own? So the brothers did just that and launched the Milkless Chocolate Vegan Crunch Bar. Visit www.truprotreats.com to taste a little bit of cruelty-free heaven. Use promo code PSR at checkout to save on your order. And as an added perk, 25% of all proceeds are donated to animal farm sanctuaries. Triple Treats, helping animals one chocolate bar at a time. All right, guys, and welcome back. So before the break, we were about to get into Ken's career, starting right back at the beginning when he was about 18 to 19 years old. Ken, I'll let you take it away from here. Yeah, you know, um, it was my mom. Um, She's the one who told me that if you want to drive your car that she had just given me, you have to pay for your gas. You have to pay for your insurance. And I was like, all right, well, I, I was 15 and a half at the time. And she's, she said, I, I, I think you should get a job in food service because um, her sage advice was if you work in food service, you'll always have a job. And she was right. Uh, like I, I've never left food service, maybe once or twice to do, you know, retail, but um, the food service really was uh, the, the, um, the, the, the focus of, of uh, my career. And I'm glad that she pan you know, planted that seed. Um, the bulk of my life, <clears throat> you know, I would say probably the first 15, 20 years was um, spent in, in retail. Uh, I worked from, you know, most fast food places, everything except McDonald's. I don't know how I didn't end up working at McDonald's, but uh, I, I was a district training coordinator for Taco Bell. I helped open restaurants for a company called El Pollo Loco. Um, you know, all these these uh, meat based companies, which uh, was hard for me, but you know, I, I uh, it paid the bills and and really gave me the foundations for what was coming next. Um, and you know, seeing what was wrong with our food system and how we could make it better. Um, I think that the transition into healthy foods was uh, my last retail, big retail project um, company that I worked with was uh, I was the national training manager for Jamba Juice. And um, that's where I made the transition into uh, non, uh, non-traditional or what we called in retail uh, uh, non-commercial uh, uh, food service. So uh, I did a, um, I opened up the first Jamba Juice on a, a university campus uh, at Loyola Marymount back in uh, 2001. And that uh, introduced me to the company who was the food service contractor at that campus, uh, Sodexo. Um, <clears throat> so we, we opened that restaurant, Sodexo liked my work, and they recruited me to um, help them build out their retail or um, retail concepts within the universities and so my job there was um, kind of a project job I would go around the country when they would sign contracts with new universities and help open up retail food courts and so sometimes that meant putting in a national brand like a you know a Starbucks or Jamba Juice or something like that and sometimes it meant I got to design my own concept. And so that's where I started having the freedom to be able to add menu items that were plant-based and healthier options uh, to the menu because I was completely in charge of, of flushing out the menu. And that, that transition uh, led me to a huge project at the University of North Texas. So um, I, uh, I joined the university um, back in, in 2005 when Sodexo had the contract there, but as contract food service goes, um, they lost the contract at some point, but I stayed on with the university uh, in a special projects role. And my first project was to take uh, a, uh, a, a, a broken dining hall, one that we were honestly gonna close. Uh, it wasn't saying a lot of business and um, of the five dining halls on campus, we, we spent three months 
transitioning that dining hall into the nation's first all vegan dining hall. And that's, you know, uh, that's kind of a good stopping point uh, because at, at that point, my career uh, really took a different direction. And that's when I was introduced to my work uh, at the um, uh, Humane Society and helping them with their, what they called uh, meat reduction programs. Wow, that's so much. So wh where did, where did uh, Little Frida's come into the mix amongst yes. all of that? So Little Frida's, that, that was, um, that was, uh, back in uh, 19, this was 93. Um, so <clears throat> I was I was with uh, the uh, El Pollo Loco and I was opening restaurants for them. And I said, wow, I could do this for myself. And so I reached out to a lady who actually opened Little Frida's initially and it, it wasn't doing very well. She wasn't a restaurant person. Um, and uh, she, she said, you know, uh, after I interviewed her, um, would you like to purchase Little Frida's? And I go, I'd love to, but you know, like you, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing research. Uh, I, I wanna know more about fast casual and how I can open my own restaurant. And so long story short, she introduced me to a partner my sister got involved. Um, so the three of us with some family money, we were able to purchase the coffee shop and um, it was quite a ride. Um, you know, we, when we bought it, it was, it was, it wasn't doing so well. And within just a couple of months, we were able to uh, get it profitable. What was really cool about uh, little Frida's is that it had the foundations to be set up as, as one of the, um, most successful coffee houses in Los Angeles. And that was my goal when we bought it. I was like, I want this to be on the map. I remember there was a, another coffee shop that was always in like the LA times and, you know, being like the number one coffee shop in LA. And I said, we're going to be the number one coffee shop in LA. And that happened. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I think what made it happen faster rather than slower was the, um, the A-list celebrities that would come in there. <laughs> yeah. Like Ellen uh, DeGeneres. Yeah, Ellen DeGeneres, Keanu Reeves. Um, uh, we, we had Madonna come in one time. I mean, it was, it was a who's who there. And so that got a lot of attention, but it was really the Ellen, uh, the Ellen DeGeneres visit that, that put us on the map. And still today, you'll, you'll see references to it. Um, back, in the, uh, back in the 90s, she, you know, she had her show, The Ellen Show, and and um, there, there was a point where she, uh, an episode where she came out uh, to her friends uh, and um, she wanted to do that. She actually did that uh, at Little Frida's. Um, and it's also the place where if she, if she talks about her relationship with her wife, Porsche, um, that they had their first date. And so, you know, it really kind of put it on the map. There's all sorts of references to it um, online you can find. Um, but yeah, we, um, we ran that for about three years. And then um, uh, we, we decided to, uh, to sell that um, because it was doing quite well, but it was a heavy lift. I was driving a lot to get there from Long Beach to Lakewood or Long Beach to West Hollywood. And um, so my sister and I decided to, um, uh, sell it and then we opened up another one closer to home called Atlas Coffee. Ran that for about two years but um, that that was pretty awesome. It was local, it was family, it was uh, in the community where I grew up and then uh, Starbucks started moving into town and I saw the writing on the wall. I was like all right it's best that I uh, uh, leave the coffee business and, and move on in, uh, into what I know best, which is fast casual. And so uh, that was a big chunk of my decades in, in the uh, retail world. But it's all, it's all a learning experience. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say you took away from that experience running your own coffee shops that led you to ultimately opening Nutrix Taco Shop? And how, how has that uh, helped shape you as a business man in the food space? Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I was green back when I was doing that. I mean, I knew how to open restaurants, but I didn't know how to write contracts for leases and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And Little Frida's and Atlas Coffee really gave me the foundations for understanding how to do that. Um, but growing up in Southern California, of course, Mexican food is huge. Yeah. And um, I, I, I can tell you um, uh, uh, that, that a lot of time I spent uh, – 
crossing the border into Tijuana with my buddies and, and enjoying a few nights out there. And that was my introduction to Mexican food. It was that, that Baja style Mexican food. And so that, that has been my favorite food and my passion uh, uh, throughout my career is, is, is working with uh, that menu. And so uh, New Tricks was born uh, on that platform that you could take uh, great tasting Mexican food, which if you look at the history of it, really was plant-based in the beginnings. Um, and 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 take that menu and make it available to people who love that that flavor profile and make it healthy, but not too healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I still wanted it to be a little, you know, street-like. So um, when we get to the point that we open the restaurant all, all the way, we're going to have tortas, burritos, street tacos, um, migas, uh, you know, chili quilis, uh, my favorite breakfast item. Uh, and, and we're going to, we're going to really have fun with the menu. So that, 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 uh, is going to be, uh, our next, um, our next big lift is getting the restaurant open. Yeah. So tell me, tell us a little bit more about that because when we first got on our initial interview to talk about coming on the show as a guest, you said that you were looking to go forward with opening new tricks as, uh, as a fast casual restaurant, but right now you're just focused on the catering and the direct consumer online uh, sales. So tell, t- tell me about that. Tell us about that. What, what, what caused you to make that move before going into opening the restaurant? Yeah, so you know, obviously we're we're in the midst of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic right now, and it's been really hard on the restaurant industry. Um, you know, there's so many forces that are beyond our control uh, with local governments being able to just you know determine how many guests you can have in your restaurant, um, which has uh, um, you know encouraged a lot of businesses in order to survive to go to like curbside delivery or mobile um, or even just you know delivery period. And um, so we decided that it would be best to wait um, until COVID is kind of subsided uh, to go live with the restaurant because we want it to be successful. And as you know, um, it's, it's a significant investment. And so we're, we're going to wait, um, but we're, 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 we're developing um, and actually we launched new tricks with the uh, direct consumer online. Uh, so we, we lost, uh, launched uh, new tricks, taco shop.com and we've got the hot sauce and some t-shirts and we're going to expand our retail offerings there. Um, so we've been doing quite well with that. And then uh, when Sandra, my wife and I moved to Texas, um, we decided that we're going to focus on, uh, to building the catering and so just this past weekend um, with a student who graduated from UNT and who now has a production company uh, we did a, a, a location catering for them which uh, brings me back to the days when I had little Fritas because we used to do a lot of that um, back then so we're going to really just build the catering and the retail right now which were two of the three parts of the business anyway and so when we do go live with the brick and mortar um, we'll already have those those two bits of our business up and running and successful. That's that's so awesome. I just love how adaptive you are because that's really what it comes down to. Being an entrepreneur, there there and or whether it's like whatever you're doing in life, there is no straight path to success. You're going to have obstacles and losses and failures that happen all along the way. It's going to be a constant zigzag to ultimately get to where you want to be. It's never going to be a straight line. And that's just, it just shows you right there. If you really are about it, you have to adapt no matter what. You have to be ready to adapt and ready to change. So what would you say would be your best piece of advice for entrepreneurs? But I guess more specifically, like vegan entrepreneurs who are up and coming what would you be? What would be your best advice for them trying to enter into the into the market, whether it be with a restaurant and a food business, or just with a vegan product in general? Yeah, um, first, do a lot of homework. Um, homework is so important. Um, talk to people who are already in the industry, whether it's a vegan industry person or or not. Um, people that are successful. Um, Get a mentor in your life, uh, whether that's through the Small Business Association score program or just someone who you run into when you're doing your research. And then I think the third element um, before you start up is have a plan. Um, There's a lot of great um, uh, 
planning, some business planning software out there. And regardless of whether you're looking for investors or you're just doing it on your own, having that plan as a roadmap to success will definitely help you um, be ready for the unknowables. Um, and you can never be all the way ready. Um, uh, there's still going to be some surprises, but if you do those three things, then you're going to have the best chance at being successful. I, I think that's really great advice. And the one other thing that I would probably say to add to that about with the end where you're saying adapting is one thing I've learned because I've always been the planner. Mm -hmm. I've learned that you have to not over plan and just do a little bit more doing as well. So it's always great to have that plan, but you have to actually at some point put it into action and be okay with things not being perfect right at the start. And eventually it's like adapting your plan along the way is what ultimately leads them to as close to perfect as possible. Well, you know, in the restaurant industry um, and over the last probably decade of my career, I uh, ran into young chefs who would ask me, you know, how, how can I um, get into the restaurant business? What's the best first step? And I always would, would say, um, become a dishwasher. And I'm probably not the first one that said that. I think Anthony Bourdain used to say that as well. Um, uh, you know, get in there, learn how to wash dishes. Um, work your way up, you know, get that practical experience because that's going to, you know, seeing it from the inside out, whether it's the restaurant industry or whatever industry you're in, you know, start at the lowest level and work your way up. Uh, if you have that time, if not, you know, figure out where you can get that experience really, really quick um, because it'll pay off in the end. It'll set you up for success. I think that's really great advice too. And it's funny you say that because my, Senior, my senior year of, of college at Union College, I took uh, an economic internships course. And I was taking that while writing my senior thesis on opening a fast casual restaurant. The restaurant wasn't vegan because I wasn't vegan at the time, but I actually have since adapted the plan and kind of have it tucked away on the back burner for later. I've adapted it to be a vegan restaurant, the menu at least. But my professor, gave me that advice for my internships course. He said, listen, for just for your, for your, for your internship, go get a job working in a restaurant. Doesn't matter what it is, whether you're washing dishes, busing tables as a, as a server, just get in there and observe as much as possible from the ground level, be very aware, ask questions, take notes and I can't tell you enough how much that helped me with writing my business plan. Just getting the experience. Experience really makes the biggest difference. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's nothing better than, than that solid experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So before, before we kind of like wrap things up, cause I know you said at the beginning, you wanted to talk a little bit about your jujitsu, your jujitsu and your fitness. So tell us about that kind of, how did you get into jiu-jitsu when you were younger and where is that uh, at now within your life? You know, I was, um, if, if, uh, I was a pretty hyper little kid back when I was younger and my mom, uh, again, her, her sage wisdom, uh, figured out a way to channel my energy. So she signed me up for judo classes at the local YMCA. Um, this is back in, you know, the early eighties, uh, uh, when I was still in my teens and she, um, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, so I, I started taking classes. My coach, my, my, my sensei, uh, was, uh, uh, a coach at the 64 Olympics. And so he had brought many Olympic athletes to, um, their their career in judo and and tried that with me as well um so i took lessons for many many years uh, probably about five years and then i got introduced uh, to the opportunity to try out for the 84 olympics um so it was oh, wow. the tryouts for the tryouts um so this would have been 1982 about and um you know, I, I, it was a great experience. Uh, I was a little out of my league. I, I was only a brown belt at the time, and I was playing with all these international players that were black belts, and, and I got my butt kicked on the mat. But still, I got to spend two weeks at the, at the Olympic training camp in Colorado Springs, and it was the 
the experience of a lifetime. Um, but when you're doing extreme sports, like, you know, sometimes you get an injury and uh, I was playing in a tournament, I got injured. And so, um, it, it kind of ended my, uh, uh, my judo career back in my youth. But, um, recently when we moved to Fort Worth, now this is 38 years later, <laughs> um, I'm back on the mat. Uh, I went to the chiropractor. Uh, I told him about my back injury and he's like, it's not there anymore. And so uh, I scooped up my, uh, a couple of my grandkiddos and my son, uh, who's now 38 years old and <laughs> said, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's, uh, get, let's get on the mat. And so or 35 years old, because that would have made me 15 when I had him. Um, <laughs> he's 35 years old now. And um, uh, we're, we're going three days a week. Uh, we're playing at the uh, Fort Worth judo club, which again, uh, there's two Olympians that work out there. Um, uh, the coaches, they're all Olympic uh, coaches. And uh, we're, we're, we're training with warriors, man. We're on the mat. Um, we're, I'm, I'm doing my first fight night uh, for my birthday uh, next week. And it's going to be me, my son, uh, my two granddaughters. And we're going to go in and it's going to be full on uh, fight night. And we're going to get some good uh, tournament play in. So, That's yeah. That's so cool. That's it's, so cool. Yeah. You know, and how do you feel being on a plant-based diet, like a fully vegan diet? How do you feel doing all of this? And I mean, you're not, you're not old. How old are you? Yeah, I'm 59. I'll be 59 this 50, week. I mean, 59, but how do you, how do you feel doing all of this activity on a plant-based you know, diet and, and being 59 years old? I, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the room with guys my same age and on the mat and they're complaining about their health. Uh, some of them are overweight, um, you know, and then, then that's based with diet. I think it's my wife told me that abs are made in the kitchen, right? So yes. I, mean, <laughs> I, preach I preach that. And not only do I preach that, I practice it to show people exactly abs are made in the kitchen. <laughs> so we, you know, we eat really good, you know, obviously with the, the extra activity, I have to pound a little more calories than I want. So, um, but I, I make them quality calories and, you know, a lot of fruit, a lot of fresh vegetables, um, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, healthy proteins. We, we like, uh, my, my favorite thing is, uh, to I call them tofu logs. I, I mm -hmm. bake tofu, season it, and I bake it. And that's, that's kind of my snack throughout the day. So I get a lot of the protein that us vegans don't get, um, <laughs> supposedly, but, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm healthier than people, most people my age. Um, and I get on the mat and the energy level, I can feel it if I don't, if I don't eat those quality calories, um, it's just not there. And um, I, I don't get injured anymore. My recovery from those intense workouts um, is super speedy. Uh, and I feel great. Um, and I really it's it's all because of the diet. And I think that if I was eating a traditional standard American diet, the sad diet, um, I wouldn't be able to compete right now. I wouldn't be able to be at the level of, of, um, of, of play that I'm at um, because it really goes back to the diet. It really, it really, really does. And, and ultimately, like, if you're trying to see changes in just the outward appearance of your physique, it boils down to calories in, calories burned enough protein and the type of activity that you're doing. So if you're trying to build the lean and muscular physique, then you want to do more resistance training. But if you have more endurance goals, long distance running, hiking, biking, or even jujitsu, martial arts, then you want to do more of that training. But what's going to determine your health, your longevity, your recovery, how you feel on a daily basis is the food sources. That's where they really make the biggest difference. And I, I'm right with you. I just feel so amazing being on an all vegan diet and predominantly an all vegan whole foods plant-based diet. That's the big difference is not just a vegan diet because you can be vegan and be unhealthy. Oreos are vegan. Prime example. And so if you're constantly eating a lot of calories that are like Oreos and empty calories, then you're not going to be healthy. You're not going to get the nutrients that you need. But if you're focusing on 80% nutrient dense food sources and they're all vegan food sources, it makes the biggest difference. And it's crazy because I actually just had hip surgery and not even a week in already back in the gym after having my hip surgery, I had an arthroscopy done 
already back into the gym, taking an easy lower body, but doing like hitting upper body weight workouts, walking fully on my own, no crutches. They said I would have to be on crutches for almost four weeks. <laughs> I was off the crutches within literally like the, the next day, that night when I got home from surgery, I was like, oh, I feel good enough to walk around my apartment without crutches right now. And the whole next day, walking perfectly fine, no crutches. And I definitely, definitely attest it to the diet. I recover because even before the surgery, normal workouts i was recovering insanely fast mm. insanely fast and i just feel great overall i have so much energy it's just definitely the only regret about veganism is not going vegan sooner I, i've seen it change people's life not, not you know not just the uh, the um extreme athlete athletics like we do but you know um my good friend wanda white i mean when i first met her type 2 diabetic um over the years that we worked together, uh, she started losing weight. She started adapting a plant-based diet. Um, now I just saw her the other day. Um, she's lost another 20 pounds. Um, her doctor's considering taking her off the metformin that she's on for her for her diabetes. Um, she's almost completely reversed type two diabetes. You know, you read about it, but unless you know somebody that's actually had that dramatic shift in their lifestyle um, and has has had that impact, um, you, you know, it, it really it's 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 unbelievable when you hear these stories, um, people reversing heart disease, um, you know, all sorts of things. And, and it's there, it works. And, you know, we're just bombarded with, uh, industry, you know, food industry, uh, commercials on, um, you know, how we should not eat healthy and it's keeping us sick. And, you know, you and I both know that, that if you change your diet, um, if you're sick, you're going to get better. If you're an athlete, you're going to get stronger and faster. Um, so why not do it? You know, change your diet, change your life. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And, and speaking just on those two things specifically, type two diabetes and heart disease, a mm -hmm. plant-based diet is the only thing proven to cure both. The only yeah. thing proven to cure both. So, wow. That, Ken, this has been this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Before we continue on, I'd like to take a brief moment to highlight our team member of the week, something we do every episode to show our love and appreciation for our ever-growing family. My name is Imani Parsons, and I am proud to be this week's Plant Strength Team Member of the Week. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Vegan Mani. Plant Strength Moto, sustainability for the mind, body, soul, and environment means a lot to me because when I think about health and wellness and nutrition, I think of it as being all different aspects of our life working together in harmony and that harmony is not always perfect but when you're given um when you're giving efforts to all those areas of your life everything comes about full circle so it's super important that when we focus on health and wellness we're focusing on all of those things because if you're lacking in one area it's going to definitely hinder your overall health so for me, for me personally, um, what I put into my mind, I'm very careful about it. Um, whatever I consume in my mind, in my body, in my soul, it has to be effective and it has to be super healthy for me so I can be the best version of myself. And our environment is going through so much right now. So it's really important that we um, really treat our environment like it matters because it really does matter. So having health and having just effort towards all those areas in your life just really makes you feel better and it really makes you do better. So in return, you can be the most healthiest, happiest version of yourself. And that's what it's all about. All right, guys, now it's time for my favorite part of the show, our growth spurts and growing pain segment. So it goes, things change and I know that though I've got no control, that's just the way that we grow. And no one told me what's ahead on this road, so until I break the mold. 
For those of you who haven't heard of this segment before, at the end of every show, we ask each guest what a recent growth spurt of theirs is, an accomplishment that they're proud of, as well as a growing pain, something that they're still trying to get better with. Both of these can be health, work, or life related. So with that, we'll start right at the top. Ken, what is a recent growth spurt of yours? Focusing on family. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that my wife, Sandra, and I moved from Long Beach, California recently, about five months ago, to to um, Fort Worth. And really the driver behind that was um, the importance of our family. My son uh, and his wife and our four grandkids moved here uh, about a year ago, and we wanted to be a big part of their life. Um, at this point, being a, a full-time uh, grandparent is uh, important to us, uh, and so uh, we we uh, we feel that that uh, being with family is uh, our our biggest growth spurt. I love that family is so important, and I try to tell people this all the time. It's it's about the relationships that you make. <laughs> those are what make the biggest difference in your life. And, and those are the things that you're really going to cherish and hold on to at, at the end of the day. It's not about how much money you have or how many material things. It's, it's the people closest to you that matter the most that you need to make a priority. Absolutely. Family first. It's so important. Family first. I love that. I love that. So what would you say a current growing pain of yours is something that you're still trying to get better with? Yeah, you know, you always have to be looking to improve yourself. And um, I, I think our my biggest growing pain goes back to the fitness stuff that we were talking about, you know, in transitioning from California to Texas, there was a five month gap there where I wasn't really working out very much. And I'm feeling it. Um, so um, getting out, hitting the street, doing running. Uh, I like doing TRX. Uh, so I'm doing some, some, uh, TRX because there's no, uh, I don't have weights in the house right now. And, um, just, just trying to stay up to the level of fitness that I, that I need to be at, um, to support my sport. Um, and that I want to be at to support my health. And, uh, that's been the biggest challenge, especially with what's going on with COVID, you know, uh, we've had to change our dynamic. We've had to change the structure of what our workouts look like. So a lot of hit training at home. Yeah. You're not alone. You're not, everyone is experiencing that. And I mean, here in, in New York city where I'm at, the gyms are still open. I was actually just at the gym this morning. Are things closed in Texas? The gym. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I I haven't seen any of the gyms open. I think some of the smaller ones that can do it, like the CrossFit gyms, mm -hmm. are open. Uh, in our judo, obviously, there's a lot of preca um, precautions that we're taking. So, um, in between the kids' class and the adults' class, we all get out there and we spray the mats with sanitizers. And I think the hardest thing for us is we have to work out with face masks. Yeah. Um, so when you're out there for 90 minutes breathing as hard as we breathe um, and you have to do that through a wet face mask because you're sweating, um, it just, it just, it's challenging, but you know, it's a small price to pay for, um, you know, staying protected and protecting the people around you. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be the first one to rip that mask off when the government says it's cool to do so uh, <laughs> yeah. because uh, yeah, I like to breathe. <laughs> same, same, but I'm glad you're hanging in there. And, and that's the whole purpose of this growth spurts and growing pain segment. It's something that I love doing every week with each guest. It's something that I do every week with all of my clients, just ask them something they're proud of from the last week. And then also something they're still trying to get better with. It's just a nice way to stay accountable and to be self-aware that that self-awareness is ultimately what leads to you making positive change in your life. Because if you're not aware of things that could be better in your own life in whatever way that is there's no way for you to ever make them better and to see the positive results that come with through you know going through that change so thank you again ken for coming on the show and and sharing your story and, and sharing your growth spurts your growing pains i really love this this whole episode with you you're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's, it's been a, a, a joy to get to meet you and hopefully we'll get to meet in person someday soon. And um, uh, I just uh, wish you all the success in everything that you're working on. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and hopefully we'll be uh, 
collaborating business wise. You know, we've got our new plant based meat chicken bites on the market. So we'll have to have some talks about that. But uh, I'm just, you know, I love to see everything that you're doing. And I love having this opportunity to learn from you. So thank you again. Um, but before we kind of sign things off, I'd like you to let everyone know where they can find you online. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're all connected with our little phones here, right? So, um, uh, personally, you can find me uh, at KenBots, uh, search Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. Uh, I think I'm on, <laughs> on tic Instagram, TikTok. I don't know. Everything. Um, everything yeah. Um, it all buzzes in my pocket. Uh, for the for the for the coffee shop uh, or for the I'm sorry coffee shop I had a little Rita still uh, for the taco shop um, you can connect with us at Nutrix Tacos uh, on Instagram Facebook and Twitter um, and we also have a website NutrixTacoShop.com and you can buy our sauces and our our t-shirts and other great things coming soon in the future. Awesome! And where do you cater uh, in the area down in Texas? Yeah, we're we're in the Fort Worth area, um, so uh, trying to stay in that area because it's just me and my wife right now. Um, we really want to build the business there. So Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, if you're here, if you've got a business, if you're making a movie, uh, we'd love to we'd love to feed uh, feed you. All right, guys, you heard it first. Don't hesitate to reach out if your company needs some catering or if you need some catering for a family party or event. And then, of course, make sure to go follow Ken online at Ken Bots and at Nutrix Tacos, as well as look up NutrixTacoShop.com to get some of their sauces. Um, but again, one more time, Ken, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this episode. I hope that you guys did too. And as always, until the next one, we've got one more to the season, and that is our bonus episode 11. So until the next one, as always, I'm your host, Bobby Lynch, and this is Plant Strength Radio. Plant Strength Radio is hosted by Bobby Lynch, produced and edited by Kiwan Harrison. Original theme music by Alex Brinkley and Tyson Bryce. If you would like to hear more podcasts like this, please like, share, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts can be streamed. To learn more about Plant Strength, the company behind this podcast, please visit www.plantstrengthperformance.com or follow us on social media at Plant Strength Performance. Plant Strength. Sustainability for mind, body, soul, and the environment. Thank you for listening.